So welcome to this uh, quite short workshop today. Um, it's sort of going to be more of a lecture than a workshop, so I'm going to be demonstrating stuff um, as I go through um, the principles that I'm teaching. Um, but it's not you don't necessarily have to work along. <clears throat> you can just watch or um, maybe take notes. You can sketch a little bit. Um, but as I say, it's not because we're not quite going for kind of fully finished products. We're just sort of having a look at how you can take something as complex as a tree um, and simplify it down a bit to sort of create a, a base to work from and to a certain extent create a, something, a reasonably effective version of a tree that it'll pass in a painting or a drawing. Um, so the first thing um, I'm going to talk a little bit about is how you sort of approach the, the beginning of a tree. So different trees will have um, I'll just tilt my camera across a little bit there so you can see. Um, so I've got a few different pictures, some groups of trees, some individual trees. Um, they mostly mostly have leaves. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of what how to draw trees without leaves. But trees without leaves are a bit more straightforward. Um, what we're primarily focusing on today is how you can sort of take <coughs> a tree that has leaves and it's a kind of moderately kind of complex form and try to simplify it down so that it becomes more manageable. Um, so I've got a few different types. So say this this type of tree here that's more broken up. So you've got kind of clumps of leaves that you're looking at. So a lot more gaps um, between the tree versus those earlier um, deciduous trees that sort of oak type trees that are more clustered together. So they've got a more kind of definite edge and form. Um, so what we usually want to start with with a tree is thinking about the the leaves as a kind of continuous form so rather than thinking of them as loads of individual bits of detail so sometimes what people do when they they start trying to draw a tree <coughs> is jump in and kind of they get caught up in all these individual little bits of leaves but essentially the leaves from a distance and the further away we get from the tree start to merge together into more of a, a sort of continuous form similar to say if you were drawing like an apple. So an apple has a really obvious continuous form. It's, it's kind of closed off. The whole thing is one individual form that turns away from the light and gets darker and it turns toward the light and gets lighter. And the leaves in the tree will be doing the same thing. I'm going to start demonstrating this soon because it, it's moderately complex when you explain it, but quite simple when you draw it. Um, so if we take this tree, for instance, its general shape is sort of like an egg on its side. So pencil doesn't work. So if I was to draw a really simple version of this tree, It's that sort of shape and it sits on top of its trunk, which initially we could simplify to a shape maybe like this, and it sits on the ground. So my initial thought is what's the kind of basic shape of that tree? If you think of something like a, a conifer, like a, a pine tree is going to have more of a triangular shape, and that would be maybe the really basic shape. So sort of like a, a cone, um, whereas this, as I say, is a bit more like an oval, oval type sphere or sort of like an egg shape. <coughs> so I would begin that if I was drawing it in pencil, very, very lightly looking for that form. Um, and then the next thing that I want to look for is what's the direction of light? So we get an indication of the direction of light hitting the tree by the fact that the shadow sits almost directly below the tree little bit to the right so it seems as though the light is coming probably from about that direction so it's sort of coming from above and angling down towards the right now if this was an egg form we could quite easily kind of th realize that we're going to get a sort of curved shadow at a certain point on the egg so if you think of an egg if we were kind of turning it around and the light was coming from different directions, there would be a light side of the egg 
and there would be a dark side of the egg. And this goes back to really basic um, sort of form principles. Um, if you've ever seen sort of sphere drawings, it's the same principle, but we're applying it to a tree. Um, a really classic example of this sort of crescent shape is obviously the moon. So as the moon it angles differently towards the sun, as we look at it in the sky, the, the um, shape of the shadow on the moon changes and it can be a really thin sliver crescent or it can be a half moon or it can be this sort of, um, sort of one third moon. Um, but that's what we're looking at essentially. And that's roughly what's happening with this tree. So you can sort of see mostly the leaves on this side of that curve are illuminated and the, most of the leaves on the, the bottom side are in shadow. So they merge down more into the value of that trunk. So that's the basic form of this tree. <coughs> and you always want to think of trees as solid forms uh, or at least having some sort of form not as I think sometimes people kind of think of them as almost flat like they're looking at them whatever angle they're looking at they're sort of a 2d cutout of a tree so obviously if we walked around this tree the shape would be roughly the same from every angle it would still be this kind of general kind of flattened out sort of squashed egg shape it'll vary a little bit because there's a lot of variance but essentially that's the shape of um, these leaves and it's to do so with you would ignore the fact that it's not got a smooth surface so it's going to be irregular in its yeah shadow. Mm. so the shadow is not going to be consistent but we want to try to just initially conceptualize it as in terms of where's the light coming from so where are we going to get predominant shadows in the leaves and where are we predominantly going to get lights as we add detail to it we start to break that down um, but this just gives us a sort of an initial starting point for, for any type of tree that we're drawing. Um, you do get, I was saying, they're kind of consistent from all sides. Obviously, there are loads of exceptions to this. So you might get a tree that's been blown by the wind and it might kind of angle sideways, but it'll still have some sort of form. So what we're trying to find is, even if the tree had a trunk that angled that way and it was blown sideways, it would probably still have some kind of continuous form so all the the branches underneath the leaves would be all flowing in that direction and we would end up with some sort of some sort of shape it might be a bit more thin or a bit more pulled out um, but any tree will have some sort of it's sort of like if you imagine wrapping a net so say you had a net and you wrapped it around the tree what shape would that net be and um, that's one way to think of it <coughs> so if you had to kind of encapsulate the tree um, what would you end up with in terms of a surface and the leaves will roughly fit into that surface that you wrap around the tree and then they will roughly relate to to the light as it hits um, in that kind of uh, consistent way so they're all going to be relating to the the light in the same way so if we take go back to this example I'm just gonna lightly shade in this side of the tree form. And I'm also going to shade in the trunk below and just merge that together. So what we have now is that basic form shaded in. We've got the shadow side of the tree and we've got the light side of the tree. The next thing to do um, which is probably, so next to the, the conceptualizing the, the tree as a form, the next probably most important thing is to find the edge of the tree. So where the tree meets the background, what does it do? So um, Rob, you were talking about it being having a regular form. So here we would then start to go in and look for, not necessarily super complex, but we'd start to break up this simple form into a more complex edge. So we look maybe for where it cuts in, where it cuts back out. And it's usually okay at this stage to start to break up. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a sort of definite line that runs around the whole tree. 
if you were painting it, it could be slightly looser. You could use kind of more jagged brush strokes. If you're drawing it, you could be a bit like this. So you don't necessarily make every part of the edge identical and continuous. And I can also start to make the shadow edge more complex as well. So it's going to roughly follow that placement. But some parts, suddenly maybe the shadow might sort of through here, the shadow does actually stick up quite a lot. There's almost like a gap in the foliage. So that makes its way up into the light side. And again, you can be fairly loose with this sort of stuff. There are a few kind of isolated little shadow shapes within the light shape. And there are also some isolated light shapes within the shadow shape. So I could go back in with an eraser and start pulling out some Some light shapes, put a little shadow around them. Kieran, can I ask, are you at this stage just trying to get an impression or are you trying to basically be realistic about it? Um, I find for landscapes, you don't have to be totally faithfully realistic to something like a tree. I think what's more important is if you capture the character of it so okay you're, try you're trying to capture how it feels not necessarily have to absolutely copy um what you're looking at i, I would say the main thing so what what i'm looking for more so um, than a faithful representation is making sure i don't kind of start to get too regular with the way that i'm drawing it so something i think that people often do wrong with things like clouds and trees is if you if i was drawing the tree and i kind of make it kind of like all the same all the way around um, which some trees maybe like a, a tree that's being cut back in a in a garden might be kind of consistent but very often trees that grow kind of particularly in wilder landscapes will be affected by the wind in some way or you know something might bite their trunk or the trunk might die back and you get these different growths and it creates a sort of a lot of irregularity within the tree um, I'll be talking about that a little bit actually when we talk about trunks um, because you when you're kind of drawing a, a dead tree or a tree during winter what you're kind of mainly concerned with is the rhythm that, that kind of runs through uh, branches and through trunks um, so I could take start to break up this split in the trunk as well are reasonably familiar with what the tree looks like. I'm going to zoom in a little bit just so you can slightly better look at it. <coughs> so I could start to go even more detailed with this this edge but I'm still not you can see I'm still not thinking about individual leaf shapes. I'm just thinking about the edge of where the, the light meets the dark. Um, or up, up here, I'm thinking about the edge where the, the tree's actually meeting the background. Um, which, if you were painting, would be kind of quite clear because in the background, we've actually got kind of like a hillside behind, and then up here would be blue. And um, so we've got a sort of paler green and a, and a blue behind this tree. So you would do the same thing if I was making this top edge more complex. I could start to find smaller shapes. And edges are always really crucial. Pretty much anything you're drawing, if you even in portraits or still lifes, it's generally the edges where 
textures um, sort of most clearly demonstrated. It's not so much in the the parts that are kind of illuminated strongly or the parts that are in shadow. It's where the the light meets the shadow and and where the edge of the the form meets the background. So where the the tree is overlapping the background, that's where I'm. Um, really focusing on and where the, the light and the dark meet is also where I'm focusing on. So you can see I've not worked within the lights and I've not really worked within the shadows beyond putting these quite dominant shapes in or these bits where there's kind of like a, a drastic incursion of the, the shadow up into the lights or the lights down into the shadows. Um, and I can also start to apply um, basic principles of form to this now. So um, if you're familiar with reflected lights, we're going to have lights going to be kind of going down, hitting the landscape below the tree. Put a little bit of a shadow below the tree as well. So light's going to be traveling down, hitting the landscape below the tree and bouncing up. And it's going to create a little bit of a fill light inside um, these leaves. So some the leaves that kind of face down towards the light are going to be illuminated by that reflected light. And the ones that aren't quite receiving direct light and they aren't quite receiving um, reflected light are going to be a bit darker. So if I wanted to kind of explore that, I could make this edge up here that's further away from the reflected light a bit darker. The inside of some of these clumps would then be a little bit darker as well. Um, you can see I'm not being super neat. Um, I find that's helpful for working with trees just because it starts to capture the kind of raggediness of the, the leaves. If I tried to be super neat, it would make it feel too much like a a solid form. Obviously we're thinking conceptualizing, conceptualizing it like a solid form initially but we want to give the impression of, of looseness and kind of the possibility that there are these gaps or the sort of raggedness that we have at the top. Um, if I was to shade the background a bit that might help to get a sense of the ragged edge above the tree as well. go back to this reflected light, maybe a little bit kind of darker right at the bottom as well. And at this stage I can go in and start to darken the trunk. So the trunk is also, or is just generally a little bit darker than the, the leaves, the foliage. In this case, the trunk is is totally in shadow. Um, it's not always the case, so sometimes the trunk might be somewhat illuminated. Um, if the trunk was illuminated, we would then draw it kind of reacting to, to form as well. So let's say this is something like a, a tree branch shape. I've just made up there, but say that's being illuminated the same way, so the light's coming from this direction. One side of the trunk is going to be dark. And the other side's going to be lighter. So if the trunk was being illuminated, we would just be applying the same really basic principles of rendering things, how form works, and just applying that to the tree trunk. In this case, the tree trunk is just in shadow, so pretty much all of it's pretty dark. Um, <coughs> it would depend a bit on the, the color of the trunk as well, so you get variance between um, different tree trunks, something like a birch, obviously different type of what tree. What density of pencil are you using, Karen? Um, it's just a mechanical um, HB. No, it's HB, is it? Yeah. Yeah, not super dark, this one, actually. Um, so within the foliage, we could then start to draw where some of the, the tree trunks are kind of heading up, so the places where they kind of poke through the foliage a little bit. That, again, starts to make it feel like the form of the foliage is broken up. So you can see, I think one of the main kind of takeaways, I suppose, from this process is it's not so much a case of adding 
loads of leaves or kind of drawing lots of detail immediately. It's taking something really simple and breaking the detail into that simple shape. Um, so it's sort of, it's almost working in reverse of if you were kind of starting with a tree trunk and then you were kind of, if I was to draw each individual leaf kind of coming off that tree trunk, which is something I'm going to talk a little bit about later because it is actually a, a thing that you have to do if you're too close to a tree um, because if the tree is kind of dominating your field of view or it's dominating the painting, it doesn't work quite so well to do the simplification method. So this is more so for trees that are kind of mid-ground. Um, the further into the background it goes, the more simple it would get, which I'll be talking about a little bit as well. Um, but this is sort of like a mid-ground tree. Um, so I could start to go in and at this stage put more little shadow shapes. I could, if I was going to go in, I could erase some of the the light shapes as well. But I'm still primarily thinking of it in a sort of two-tone way. So there's light shapes and there's dark shapes and they're sort of meeting. And where they meet creates this kind of ragged, ragged edge made up of all these leaves. And if you were going to try to push the detail of it, you could then start to go in and kind of pick smaller and smaller leaves or smaller and smaller dark and light shapes out of it. Um, could start to look for more patchiness within the darker leaves, within the lighter leaves. Start to look for little bits of leaves that are maybe in the shadow, but they're just sitting outside of the, the rest of the form, maybe not even quite connected, which then starts to kind of give the impression that you've got maybe very small twigs kind of sticking out that from this distance you can't quite make out, but you maybe make out the leaf. And all of this starts to make it feel like a less continuous surface. Um, but that initial form is what gives us, it's what holds everything together. Otherwise, it's, it's a lot trickier to kind of get to this stage. And I got to this stage reasonably quickly. And for a kind of mid-ground tree in a, in a drawing, I wouldn't be kind of too unhappy with that. Um, so now, a little bit. Um, pushing it even further, I could then start to put half tones. So I've not actually put any half tones in yet. So places where um, maybe some of the leaves are a bit darker and this point in here would be probably the lightest part of the tree. Um, sorry, I was just, uh, hopefully you're back in, Steph. Sorry, I um, missed your um, comment, but hopefully you're back in now. Um, yeah, so I was basically just continuing with this tree and um, adding kind of progressively more detail to it. Um, so yeah, this, this part of the tree is going to be the sort of lightest place where maybe the leaves are at their lightest and then as they move away from that point they just get kind of progressively darker so we can start to put half tones in. There aren't loads of these actually in this tree, but the other thing that we would look for, sometimes they're a bit more obvious immediately. Um, the other thing we can look for are um, what's called, usually they're called sky holes. 
So kind of parts of the tree where the we can kind of see through the foliage, maybe two branches kind of split apart, um, causing there to be a kind of a gap. I can't find tons actually in this reference, but I'll kind of make up a few. Um, I'll have another look at a working from a different sort of reference in a moment, um, which will have a lot more. Um, but yeah, you get these these points where there's kind of gaps in the tree um, where the sky might show through or something in the background might show through a bit. Um, there are a few actually come down here where the light background actually shows through a little bit so I could pop those in as well. But this um, has quite dense leaves so the more the dense the leaves are the, the kind of less likely you are to get these sorts of shapes. Things like pines tend to have very few, if any, any gaps in them at all, but they, they often add a little bit to the um, breaking up that um, the, the leaf shapes. You always encircle them with the dark, dark tone. Pardon? Do you always encircle them? The um, yeah, I sort of am here. Just they, they sort of stand out. It usually helps a bit, um, just because they, it exaggerates the sense that that like a light color is showing through them. Okay. Um, in paint, I probably wouldn't. You just sort of paint them in, and and they would be fine. One thing to note about them is, um, and it's hard to do it with this one, but the, the smaller the sky hole, the darker you would usually kind of push the tone that's showing through so if for example there was a light green um, you can sort of see in this reference that uh, hillside behind is, is quite light it's lighter than the shadow obviously of the tree so if that was showing through and there aren't it's a very dense um, foliage so it doesn't quite show through but if it was showing through um, the smaller the hole the darker I would make this tone so I probably wouldn't paint it as bright as is as it is in this big patch, I would kind of darken it slightly. Um, whereas if there was a very big gap in the tree, I'd probably paint it about the same uh, same value. The reason or the thinking behind that is that when we're looking at something from quite far away, so we're looking at this tree, um, <clears throat> if the gap is is quite small and there's a few leaves or or little twigs crossing it that we don't quite see, they sort of slightly darken what we're looking at. It sort of merges together and darkens the tone. So the smaller the sky hole, the more we would tend to make a little bit darker. A bigger sky hole we would make brighter. Um, if you put, the problem is if you put, say, a really bright tone, sometimes it's, it stands out as a bit too glary if it's just a tiny little dot of a tone and it's, it's super bright shining through the tree. So you can sort of mess around with that a little bit. There's loads of different circumstances, but yeah, on the whole, it tends to make for a slightly darker tone um, if you've got a very, say, a, a hole like this tiny little gap there versus if I had a, a much bigger gap or something like that above 